a proof search. And this is a very standard uh, uh, technique um, used you know, widely in logic programming, for example, um, uh, to reduce uh, the goal to sub goals uh, and in an automatic fashion. And uh, you know, we're, we're applying the same, this, this very standard approach to uh, automatic checking of, of separation logic. What makes this difficult is that, of course, we're not just working in some simple separation logic, we're working in full higher order separation logic. The, 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 the theorems we're proving make use, I mean, the, the types of refined C are modeled um, using you know, the full features of IRIS, including uh, higher order quantification, uh, invariance, uh, recursive predicates, and, and so forth. Um, and in general, these features are not well suited to goal-directed proof search. So what do we do about that? Uh, well, basically the key idea is that uh, we simplify the problem by restricting the top level structure of the goals that we consider um, so that uh, at least at the top level, we can enable efficient search without any need for backtracking. Um, and we, at the same time, we do allow inside, uh, of course, in, in the model of refined C types, we allow arbitrary use of iris propositions, but those are sort of beneath the layer of the top level structure. Um, and so as long as the, uh, the developer of refined C provides a sufficient number of typing rules to guide how you should um, how you should solve goals involving these refined C types, then um, uh, that then you can insert those typing rules into uh, the apparatus of the goal-directed proof search. So to make this a little more concrete, I mean I'm not going to go into any details about this, but just to show you the syntax of how this works, we have a, a we've carved out a fragment of iris which we call lithium, and here's the syntax. Um, and the key here is that uh, the goals are restricted. So you'll see, for example, that the left-hand side of a separating conjunction and the antecedent of the um, magic wand have to be what we call left goals, and those have a more restricted syntax. Um, uh, for example, left goals don't include any magic wands um, or universal quantifiers. And um, so by restricting in this way, uh, we can actually develop a, a, very, a very straightforward um, goal-directed proof search, which doesn't require any backtracking. You'll notice also there's no disjunctions um, in either the goals or, uh, well, yeah, in, in either the goals or the left goals. Um, so uh, the, uh, at the same time, we do allow you to put sort of arbitrary, to embed arbitrary iris propositions in there using these sort of the leaves of the goals, which are these basic goals, F, and the atomic formula A. Um, and so that's where we, uh, these things like this, this thing here, uh, <laughs> the statement typing judgment, um, and uh, this is a subsumption judgment, this is a type assignment atom. Uh, those things all are modeled internally using full, you know, the full features of IRIS, but we give uh, rules to guide their, um, their proof search, uh, which the, uh, the, the general automation of lithium doesn't need to care about. Um, and so that's a, like a very hand wavy explanation of how this, uh, how this works. Um, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I had some animations here. Uh, right, so the, the point is, yes, the, the, the goals are restricted to avoid backtracking, but in these atoms and basic goals, those things can be extended with new forms of um, typing judgments or um, uh, information about, or, or rules for, for guiding the type checking of refined C types. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip ahead and not actually walk you through a typing rule. Um, but if you're interested, I'm happy to come back to this at the end of the talk. Um, and similarly, in the interest of time, <laughs> I'm going to uh, skip the evaluation. You can read all about this in the paper. We've evaluated refined C on a number of different case studies, um, including uh, an uh, mpool, the most significant of which is an mpool allocator from the Hafnium hypervisor. Um, and the general, uh, uh, the general takeaway is that we get um, sort of a level of annotation burden that's on par with existing automatic tools. Uh, but of course, we actually produce iris proofs at the end in R. So for more details, uh, take a look at the paper. Any questions at this point? Or if not, I will move on to the, uh, um, the second part of the talk. I think you can go on for now, Eric. OK, great. All right. So. Um, so now I'm going to tell you about a very different project, um, which is uh, adapting IRIS to support liveness reasoning. So this is, uh, again, joint work with a number of people, Simon Spies, Leonard Geyer, Danny Gratzer, Joe Tesserati, Robert Krebers, and Lars Berkdale. So, so what's the problem here? Um, the problem, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, is IRIS has been used to prove a lot of interesting things about interesting programs, but it's been restricted to safety properties, OK? Properties like type safety, memory safety, data race freedom, um, time complexity, 
Uh, and that's been really the, the sort of bread and butter of Iris so far. Um, we'd like to also be able to use Iris to reason about uh, liveness properties for higher order stateful programs. Um, things like termination, starvation freedom, guaranteed service, always eventually properties. But so far, uh, yeah, there's nothing. Um, and so you might wonder why this is. Uh, if you're a little more familiar with the model of virus, then maybe it's not so surprising. So the model, uh, uh, the model is based on this idea of step indexing. So step indexing is, uh, is a kind of essential technique for modeling core features of virus. It was developed originally by Andrew Appel and David Callister in 2001 and further developed by Amal Ahmed in her thesis. Um, and uh, and it's, it's really become a sort of core technique for doing a lot of the work. And I would say it's responsible for a lot of, uh, directly responsible for a lot of the success of, uh, of, of semantics and verification work in the last 10 years, um, uh, and certainly uh, in the success of IRIS. And the reason is that it basically allows us to, to, to get some of these core features in IRIS that we use all the time. Uh, things like guarded recursive predicates, which we use um, when, defining, um, when, when defining models of, of general recursive types. Uh, impredicative invariance, which we use when, um, uh, uh, when building semantic models of languages with higher order state, in other words, pointers to arbitrary objects. Uh, so these are kind of like cyclic things that are that are difficult traditionally to, to, to model in using traditional semantic methods. And with step indexing, you sort of get a relatively straightforward and widely applicable way of dealing with them. Unfortunately, step indexing is not compatible with liveness. And uh, to give you a little intuition, I, I have to say a little bit more about like what it what it means to prove properties using step indexing. So with step indexing, rough this is all by the way a little uh, you know hand wavy, but it, it's to get across the intuition. So um, with step indexing, when you prove a property, you're basically, instead of proving a property directly, uh, you're, you're sort of dividing it into a, you're stratifying it into a family of what we call I-step properties, PI, okay, uh, where I-step means that the property can be determined of a, of, a, of a program term, E, by only examining the first I-steps of E's computation, okay? Um, so you have this sort of chain of properties that gets progressively more refined as the step index gets higher. Uh, and then the idea is that this, the property you're interested in, P, should be equivalent to the intersection over all I of P, I, B. Okay, so to prove that something is, in, to prove that E satisfies P, you prove that it satisfies P, I, V for all I. So a simple example of this is, suppose I want to prove that an execution of E never reaches an error state. Suppose that that's my P of E. Then um, the corresponding step index properties that you would prove are, if E executes for I steps, to some term e prime, then that e prime is not in an error state. Okay, so clearly, if I if if I prove that for all i, then I know that uh, it can never reach an error state. Um, so, as you probably can tell, if you're familiar with you know sort of the foundations of safety and liveness, this is this is exactly safety properties, right? This is basically saying um, uh, step indexing allows you to talk about properties that can be determined property of a term that can be determined by only examining uh, its finite traces or the finite prefixes of its traces. Um, and that's fundamentally what that fundamentally does not work for liveness properties, uh, like termination, for example. You can't tell if a program terminates by only examining um, how uh, you know how it behaves for uh, for finite sequences. Um, so what can we do about this? Um, so there, so you know, the, the, certainly we're not the first people to observe this. This is a well-known uh, folklore in the community. Um, and so one thing that people have tried to do in the past uh, is to instead of trying to prove liveness try to prove a stronger safety property instead, okay? Um, and there have been a number of papers that, that did this. So one example of this is, uh, instead of trying to prove termination, prove bounded termination, okay? Where bounded termination is something like bounded EN, instead of proving terminates E, we'll prove bounded EN, which says that E terminates within N steps of computation, okay? So basically this is a time complexity bound, for, you know, where time is, is associated with steps of computation. Um, and this, unlike termination, is a step indexed property because we can give a stratification bounded I of EN, which says if N is less than or equal to the step index I, then E terminates within N steps. Okay. Um, and uh, when you make that definition, then it's very easy to see that the property we care about, bounded EN, is equivalent to for all I N uh, bounded I E N because. Um, uh, basically, you just pick, if you want to prove bounded I, a bounded EN, you just pick an I um, that, uh, sorry, if you have the thing on the right, then you just pick an I that's greater than or equal to N, and then bounded IEN becomes synonymous with E terminates within N steps, okay? 
Um, so you just have to pick a high enough step index and, uh, and you get the property you care about. Um, so this is sort of the, this is, this is an approach that's been taken in, in, in uh, a number of prior work. There's of course a lot of details about how you form, how you actually formulate these kind of bound determination properties in a logic, in a separation logic like Iris. I'm not gonna get into those here at all. I just, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get more at the, the root cause of this, this problem that, that Iris can't reason about Leibniz. So with this idea of bound determination in hand, uh, let's see, you know, sort of, there's a natural question, which is, if you can express bounded en in your logic, why can't you sort of lift that to an, a, 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 an expression of uh, an encoding of general termination, the true Leibniz property? So, um, in particular, why can't we say terminates? You know, define this as, an, as a predicate in Iris that terminate e terminate terminates e is equivalent to exists n for n is a natural number bounded en. Okay, why can't we do this? What's wrong with this? Um, well, you could certainly define that in Iris. Um, that's no problem. The problem is it's trivial, okay? Meaning um, it's trivially true. So uh, to see that, you just take the step index model of this of this assertion, and the step index model of a, of, uh, of, of an existential just the, the step index sort of just passes through the existential. So it terminates i of e uh, would become exists n bounded i e n. Looks looks all right, but if you expand out what this actually means, it says there exists an n such that if n is less than or equal to i, then e terminates within n steps. Um, and this is trivially true. So basically for any term E and any step index I, um, there clearly exists an N such that this whole thing is true. You just pick N to be uh, greater than I, right? So if you, if you get, if, if I is given first, you can always pick N to be greater than it. And then uh, this, uh, this uh, condition N less than or equal to I is false and the whole thing becomes true. Um, so uh, basically uh, if you define terminates E this way, then you can, you can prove an iris that everything terminates. So clearly that's not uh, useful. Um, so uh, what can be done about it? Uh, well, right, so, uh, so just to reiterate, this is why in, when you talk about true Leibniz properties, not these stronger safety properties, there has been nothing. Um, so what is our solution? Well, the solution is basically that uh, we want to um, give a more meaningful, or to be able to have a more meaningful notion of existential quantification inside of the iris logic. Uh, and in order to do that, basically what that, what that corresponds to is the so-called existential or existence property, uh, which is a well-known property in logic, which says that the existential inside your logic corresponds to the existential in your metalogic, okay? Or more formally, um, it says that if, in, uh, uh, in the empty context, uh, there exists an n such that some predicate phi of n is true. Then, in fact, there exists an n in your meta logic such that uh, phi of n is derivable in the, in the logic. Okay, so it's lifting the, it's sort of hoisting out the existential from inside logic, which you can think of as this, this turnstile here is the, uh, the uh, provability in iris um, to the existential in your meta logic, which in our case would be provability in cock. Um, so, I'm going to claim now that it, well, I'm not going to claim, I'm going to show you. If, uh, if we had this existential property, uh, this is, so first of all, this is a property that's not true in Iris. It does not hold of existing models of Iris. But if we had this property, then we could actually define meaningful Leibniz properties in Iris. So how is that? How do we get that? Let's see, it's, very, it's actually very simple. So suppose we, suppose we had this existential property. Um, with the existential property, uh, we're going to prove that if you've proven terminates E in Iris, then that implies that E in fact terminates, meaning it terminate all, all, all reduction sequences terminate. Um, so how do we prove that? Well, let's just expand it out. So terminates E is what I showed on the previous slide, exists N bounded E N. Using the existential property, we can now hoist out that existential. So we learn that in fact, there exists an N such that in Iris, we can prove bounded E N. And we already know from existing work Right, that uh, if, you, uh, if you've proven bounded EN in Iris, that does imply that E actually terminates within N steps. So uh, we've in fact proven the, uh, the result we wanted. Okay, so we've shown that there exists an N set that, that, that is a, 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 a limit on all, all reduction sequences of E. Okay, so this would give us what we want. Um, so, oh, right, there you go. So um, what's the difficulty in proving this existential property? Clearly, as I, clearly this property does not hold an iris or else you know, it wouldn't be, uh, the, the terminates E wouldn't be trivially true in, in iris. Um, the problem is, is clear if you sort of expand out the definitions or the models of these judgments here. 
And so basically the model of a, of a judgment like this in Iris uh, is you just quantify overall steps, right? So if we've proven exists n phi of n in Iris, um, this, is, uh, this is the same as saying for all step indices i, I'm writing si here just to be clear, which is the step index and which is the, uh, uh, the termination bound. Um, but in Iris, si is just n uh, uh, natural numbers. So for, if you've proven for all step indices i, there exists an n such that phi n i holds, okay? Then you have to show that there exists an n such that for all i, phi n, hold, uh, phi n i holds, all right? So this is a swapping of the universal and the existential quantification that you would need to have in iris for this to be sound, okay? And intuitively, you can't prove this because in the premise, right, you get that the choice of n here could depend on i. This is exactly what we saw before when I showed that terminates e was trivial, right? I got to pick the n to be greater than the i, and that made phi n of i trivially true. Um, so the problem is uh, that, yes, this n can depend on i. Um, and so the solution, as you might guess, is that, uh, well, that's clearly, clearly it can depend on i if si here is just the natural numbers. So to make it so that n can't depend on i, we're gonna need a bigger step index, okay? Uh, so you need to lift to uh, something beyond natural numbers, okay? Um, and the idea is very simple. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give you this idea in like uh, a few, there's two slides. Um, uh, the idea is we use ordinals and hence the name transfinite iris. Uh, we, use the, we use ordinals uh, alpha as our step indices instead of natural numbers. So instead of proving that, uh, so we're gonna build models over, uh, over ordinals alpha instead of uh, the step indices i, but this, the model is, is similarly structured. So you still, the meaning of a proposition P is for all ordinals alpha P alpha. And using this, we're now, we now have a big enough space of step indices that we can defeat that, uh, that dependency of the existential on the uh, it's existentially quantified N on the, on the universally on the universal step index. So um, since this is a semantic, I normally I don't include proofs in my talks, but since this is a semantics audience, I figured, okay, I'll do one proof because um, it's a very nice little proof. I'll show you how we prove the existential property um, uh, in my remaining few minutes. So uh, so here's the proof, it, it's very nice. So we wanna show, right, if, if exists n phi n is provable, then in fact, there exists n such that phi n is provable. Um, and we expand this as we did on the earlier slide into its step index model. So for all alpha, there exists n phi n holds. Then we wanna show there exists n for all alpha phi n holds. Um, and uh, we're gonna do this very classically. Um, and in fact, we don't know, I, I don't know if we have, a, I don't think we have a proof that you need classical reasoning, but we do not know how to do this without classical reasoning. Uh, so we're actually gonna do proof by contradiction. We assume the negation of the conclusion. So we assume that for all n, there exists an ordinal alpha such that phi n of alpha does not hold. Um, by the axiom of choice, uh, we pick, we're gonna be able to pick uh, an alpha n therefore for each natural number n such that phi n does not hold. We then, and this is the key step, we define uh, a max ordinal alpha max, which is just the supremum overall n of these alpha n. Um, and I should add, uh, well, I'll, I'll add that in a sec. Uh, so we, we pick, take the supremum and then for each natural number n, uh, you can see that we have uh, the negation of uh, phi n alpha n and that, that we got from the previous step. Uh, and of course, because alpha max is the supremum, alpha n is less than or equal to alpha max. And by the downward closure property on uh, step index models, which means that uh, as, as you get a higher step index, you only get uh, fewer things are true, okay? Uh, it actually implies that uh, the negation of phi n alpha max. Um, note that the, this step where we take the supremum over all the alpha n's, this is something you can only do with ordinals. That's the key thing in the proof you can only do with ordinals. Um, and then finally, uh, we've just proven that not, uh, that, that in fact, uh, there exists an alpha, in particular alpha max, such that uh, for all n, um, uh, phi n of alpha max is false. And so that negates the original premise, okay? So that's a pretty simple proof. Um, and uh, this is the essence of how we regain um, uh, uh, the existential property, which then gives us the ability to talk about liveness in Iris. Um, there's a lot of other stuff in the paper. I've really just barely scratched the surface, but I hopefully I gave you a sort of a, like a little teaser of, of, uh, of what's cool about transfinite Iris. Um, the, the logic actually has, uh, I mean, what, what makes the, the, the work interesting beyond what, we, what I just showed is developing this into a real full-blown uh, separation logic. So basically taking the entire iris and its model of propositions 
which is based on a uh, somewhat intricate uh, recursive domain equation and adapting that to handle uh, this transfinitely step index model. Uh, we've applied this to reasoning, to, to proving uh, two different kinds of uh, liveness properties, termination and termination preserving refinement, uh, and, uh, and, and done that for a number of interesting examples. I'm not gonna talk in any detail about all this. I just wanted to sort of say that we, we have worked this out for a number of interesting case studies. Um, one that's particularly interesting, I think, is this uh, linear type system for asynchronous channels that um, is actually, it's a paper that my student, uh, Simon, who's the lead author on this work, uh, has uh, coming up uh, at uh, Popple. And in, in that paper, we actually gave a direct transfinitely step index model for a logical relation for proving this uh, termination of that, uh, of that, of all programs in that type system. And with transfinite iris, uh, so in, in that paper, we have a, you know, a 30 page appendix, which is a little hand wavy. Uh, and in, in transplanted iris, we redo that proof in 500 lines of talk. Um, so uh, it's, uh, you know, being able to, this is not surprising given that iris has been really sort of a tool for uh, productivity in semantics, right? We were able to get a lot of stuff done with the help of machine support. Um, and so with that, oh yeah, and uh, of course see the paper for more details. So with that, I'm gonna conclude. And I just wanna thank uh, the many, many people who've been involved in the iris project from the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, we're always welcoming new contributors and you can learn more about it at irisproject.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. I am going to uh, ask everyone to unmute so that we can clap. Okay, and uh, so now we have some time for questions and uh, I will remind everyone that um, after the question time, there will be a coffee break. So you will also have uh, some chances to ask questions directly to, um, to Derek in a more informal setting. But if there are questions now, we'll take some. I see one by Andy. Uh, Andy, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, sure. Hi, Derek. Um, so I've got uh, two things. Um, First, not really a question, but remind me. So, so um, step indexing using a, an ordinal bigger than, than omega is not a new idea, right, is it? So I've got a memory that Lars Berkedal and one of his PhD students did something about may and must um, contextual equivalence where they used, uh, they used an ordinal bigger than omega and did step indexing. But I can't, so to the, for my shame, I can't remember the name of the student. Can you? Derek, you're muted at the moment, just. Uh, yes. Um, uh, it was either Jan Schwinghammer or- Oh, that's it, it was, it was. Yes, that's right, it was Schwinghammer, that's right, yeah. So so this is this is an idea that's been around. Yes, yes. Yeah. The idea has definitely been around. There's a number of papers on using transfinite uh, step in, and there's a number of, there's a number of previous papers on using transfinite step indexing for various things, but not, um, not really for proving these Leibniz properties in the presence of higher order state. Yeah. So, so now, now I have a question, which is, is how important would it be to you to have a constructive account of it? Um, well, it depends on, <laughs> I, I, I told my students someone was gonna ask that question. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think it's not so important for us per se because it only, this only shows up in the meta theory. Um, so Iris is still constructive, um, but uh, um, I, so, I mean, it would be interesting. I, I would be very, I, I guess I would be surprised if, if it could be done. No, I think I have a way, but it's, it's, um, something we're working on at the moment. Oh, all right. Well, I'd be very interested to hear about it. I think, so I would say, uh, a number of the developers of Iris, um, uh, are very keen on avoiding axioms whenever possible. <laughs> um, so, uh, it was, it's, it's a source of disappointment for many of us that we had to use classical axioms here. Uh, yeah, but on, on the other hand, I mean, if you're just needing to do something externally in, in the real yeah, world, I mean, we, yeah, why not use the action? Practically course. speaking, it's not a big problem. Um, yeah. uh, but it's nice. It, it, from my perspective, it's not a problem. It, it's not per se a problem at all. It's more a problem of it would be nice to know if you really need it. If you don't really need it, that, that's, that's useful information. Mm, yeah, but I, I think one would really want, I mean, the answer is not going to be very simple. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. You, you need a good motivation for something that you, you can't do, as it were, you know. With yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah. So I'm not motivated particularly myself to work on that, but uh, yeah. I would be very interested if someone else would. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, anyway. Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks, Andy. Uh, Jesper has a question as well. 
go ahead and then... Hi, Derek. Thank you for the talk. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, um, uh, sort of, what, what are the limitations with respect to regular iris if you go to the to the transfinite route? I'm guessing that later will not commute over existentials anymore. Um, yes. Uh, really. exactly. are, are there sort of any other things that this is things that we know and love and can do now? That's Pardon good. the baby. No, no, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. Appropriate reaction to later not commuting now. So. Um, yeah. It's certainly true. Um, uh, I had a slide in there about that, but cut it for time. Uh, but yes, exactly. Uh, there are uh, sort of, it's not surprising that since, um, uh, you know, we're, we're adding a rule, um, but we, we lose other rules as well. Um, and the main one that we lose is this later exists rule, which says that later commutes with existential or that later exists implies existential of later. Um, for those of you who don't know what later is, don't worry about this. But basically, this is a this is a useful rule um, in step index logics, and uh, we, for the examples that we've looked at so far, we've been able to work around this. Um, this basically where this comes up is like um, for the for those who are not so familiar with this, where the later's come up is when you when you have an invariant on some resources, you take something out of the invariant. Um, in other words, you sort of open up the invariant and, 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 and gain access to the resources. You only get them under a later. And this is essential for this whole approach of a predicative invariance uh, to maintain soundness. Um, and the later is a slightly weaker version of the proposition. If you take a step of computation, then you get to strip off the later. But, uh, but before you take the step of computation, you want to sometimes be able to get information out of the invariant anyway. Um, and uh, uh, so the later exists rule lets you do that. Uh, so, it would be, uh, it would of course be nice if we had that rule, but it fundamentally is incompatible with the existential property. Um, so we are, it's one of our active topics of research to figure out um, uh, sort of more convenient ways of working around this. Um, and uh, it's actually, to, to be honest, one of my original hopes for transfinite iris was that it would, that in certain ways it would help with um, making step index reasoning easier, but clearly at least in this case, it, it uh, it, it removes an axiom, which is useful. So, um, so I think the answer is the jury's out. We, we haven't needed it in, in the examples we've looked at so far, but we, there are clearly other cases we know of where we would like to have it. Thank you. We take a question from Rolf now. Uh, yeah, I wanted to add something to the, um, the, the like constructivity for the ex, uh, existential property discussion. So uh, Iris actually, original old Iris actually has the existential property when the quantification is over finite types. But the proof yes. of that relies on the countably, countable pigeonhole principle. So that's a very classical proof. Right. Um, and, and, and like, I'm pretty sure you can show that the classic, that the countable pigeonhole principle implies exclusive would be a surprise if that's not the case. So, so at least for that case, I see no hope for something constructive. That's why I would be very surprised if anything, and, and amazed if anything constructive shows up for the way more complicated case with these bigger ordinals. <laughs> yes. And by the way, it shouldn't be surprising to people that the existential property holds when the, the thing being existentially quantified is finite because then it, the choice of that really can't depend uh, you know, on, the, on, the, uh, and on, the, on the step, on the step index because the step index is from, in that case, a larger set. Well, it can depend on it, but you, you not you can't it, it can't depend enough on it. Right, there's there's going to be at least one choice which you're making infinitely often. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if Andy wants to to rebut on this. I think this was more a comment for Andy than for Derek. Um, but uh, well, I, I didn't I didn't I didn't make clear what sort of constructivity I was talking about. There's there's, there's some kind of choice principle involved, but it's an, it's a constructively acceptable one. Uh, the 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 one that Murdoch and um, Benno Vandenberg and very and Thomas Streicher had, uh, I think it's called uh, weak, uh, weakly initial set of covers is what it's called now. It was originally called the axiom of multiple choice, uh, but it, it's constructively acceptable because it's it's true in pretty much every topos that you could ever think of. Um, so it's so it's not it's not neutral. It's not something provable constructively, but it's it's a, a reasonable choice principle, and it it appears to allow lots of interesting things to do with ordinals to happen. Okay, but there was also a, a use of a pseudo middle there, right? Of double negation in earlier in this proof, so yeah. that would still be overall not very <laughs> yeah. constructive. Yeah. That's true as well. Yeah, yeah. So may, may, maybe it's not possible. Okay, um, there's another question from Andrew Bone. Yes. I was told by this uh, existence existential property 
wondering if there's an obvious missing something because it looks like nothing more than an assertion of existence is constructed. What am I missing? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. It looks like nothing more than existence being constructive. What am I missing? Uh, I think the question is, it looks like nothing more than con existence being constructive. Yes. Um, uh, good question. Um, I don't know. I, mean, I would say that's exactly what it is. And existence just is not constructive in Iris currently. There's your answer. Oh. So, I mean, it, it, I, from my point of view, it, it, it is always been very surprising that the existential property doesn't hold, um, except that I don't usually think about it as being, it's not the property I want myself, <laughs> but it, it has consequences uh, in that it, it means that um, basically because of the later exists rule that we already talked about that does not hold or that is in conflict with the existential property, there's things you can prove like, for example, you can prove that exists n later to the n of false is true. Um, uh, and that basically means you're allowed to observe that, you know, um, you only have n step, you're allowed to observe the step index within the logic. And this is, this sort of causes a lot of unintuitive um, things to be true. So I, I agree. I mean, I, I find the existential property more intuitive. On the other hand, it makes certain things more difficult to reason about. Okay. Uh, I think this is a good moment to um, to end the official part of the um, the seminar.